This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts or trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, Best Buy is here to help. From air fryers for the aspiring foodies in your life to smart watches your fitness friends will love, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them, with free next-day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same-day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. Hey, Culture Festers. This special holiday edition of the Culture Gap Fest is brought to you by Best Buy. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest. Is Spirited a Holiday Triumph or a Tap Dancing Disaster? edition. It's Wednesday, December 7th, 2022. On today's show, Spirited is yet the latest adaptation of the Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol. This one's an Apple TV Plus musical comedy extravaganza. It stars Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell. And then uh, the comedian Matt Rogers stars in Have You Heard of Christmas, his own Christmas special. It's a blend of Original songs, sketches, monologues taken together. They queer the F out of the genre. It's terrific. It's on Showtime. And finally, Bane or Fun Bibolo holiday cards. We will discuss Julia Turner. I bet you have all kinds of thoughts on holiday card sending. I can't wait to hear them. But first, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, you too. I should say that you are the deputy managing editor of the LA Times, for those who don't know. And uh, Dana Stevens, you are the film critic for Slate. Indeed I am. And my uh, cherished colleague, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, good. Shall we make a show? Let us do so. Okay, let's dial back to 1843. Do we think that Charles Dickens knew his creations would end up such unkillable archetypes? Data Stevens, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy. We were just talking about Christmas Carol yeah. last week, about Dickens A Christmas Carol in our plus segment, yeah. not realizing that we would be spe- talking about yet another incarnation, and we'd a had ghostly no revival yeah. of it again this year. Holy IP, right? This is the grail. You can create IP in 1843 and in 2022, you've got a trillion dollar company. In this instance, Apple TV Plus, they've gotten into the game here. They took the elf off the shelf. They put Will Ferrell in the movie Spirited. It's a musical comedy bonanza. He's the ghost of Christmas present. He's trying to save the quite possibly irredeemable Clint Briggs, played by Ryan Reynolds. He's a dirty ops consultant whose specialty is selling your soul for you. I think familiar to all of us living in the modern world. Um, The movie also stars Octavia Spencer, Tracy Morgan, and Sunita Mani. Let's uh, listen to a clip Okay, in the clip, we're going to hear Ryan Reynolds, his character, Clint. He's got some tough questions. He's turning it back on the Ghost of Christmas present, played, of course, by Will Ferrell. Let's, uh, let's listen. Question one, were you ever alive? Uh, yes. When? Uh, well, I've been dead nearly two centuries. What? Oh, my God. You've been doing the same job the whole time? No, no. I was, uh, first ten seasons, I was in research. Uh, and then our GC present retired. GC? GC Go- Ghost of Christmas present. Good, good. Yeah. Um, of course. Retired. And uh, I was called up to the show. Oh, my God. You know that first save? Mm. Incredible rush. Huge. Felt like I was really making a difference. Mm. Was making a difference. But you're not anymore? Okay, you know what? I've answered your three questions. Wait, you just answered my fourth. Why Why do you feel like you're not making a difference anymore? What the hell is wrong with you? Me? I have never once had to put up with this level of bullshit from a perp. <laughs> All right. Dana, let me start with you, the film critic. This is a, I, I've read a $75 million spectacle. It's not a cheap, you know, throwaway Hallmark TV movie. No disrespect. It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite the production. It comes with some twists some degree of originality, right? The ghosts who might save our souls. 
um, on the one hand, have been kind of corporatized into a business uh, almost. And uh, and the second is that many of them or some of them, you know, they long to be mortal again. They, they played with the theme. They varied the theme here at least a little bit. What do you make of this movie? Yeah, this is some very elaborate world building around the Christmas Carol that that <laughs> yes. overlays it with what I think of as the sort of bureaucratic afterlife tradition, right? Mm-hmm. Which you see in Beetlejuice and nice, yeah. Heaven Can Wait. I mean, there's a long history of movies yeah. that, that look at the afterlife as this kind of yeah. um, a corporation, right? Where yeah. where some the angels are sort of like minding the earth, and so I guess that's the idea. And without giving any of the twists away, it sort of it turns out as we hear in that clip that you can cycle in and out of these jobs of ghosts of Christmas present. So Farrell's character is both an agent in that bureaucratic afterlife and uh, someone who used to be alive on Earth. And we learn who he was and how he became who he became in heaven or wherever you want to call the place he is over the course of, of this movie. And then, of course, Ryan Reynolds is basically playing the Grinch, the bad guy, you know, the kind of corporate um, raider guy who has to be uh, taught the, the error of his yeah, ways. Scrooge. Yeah. yeah, he's Scrooge, basically. Yeah. Um, but I'm just saying there's like, there's a whole complex yes. world behind him, exactly. which is not really necessary to completely understand or pay attention to to enjoy this movie. I mean, I would say that your enjoyment of Spirited will entirely hinge on how you feel about Pasek and Paul, the songwriting team that mm. wrote these songs, who are also the songwriters behind The Greatest Showman, uh, behind Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway, La-La behind La La Land. La La Land. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there are people who have a great deal of Scrooge-like hatred in their hearts toward Pasek and Paul and think that they're sort of a very weak ripoff of a um, classic Tin Pan Alley-style songwriting team. I happen to be fans of all three of those properties, at least musically. I don't think The Greatest Showman hangs together as a musical, but it has a few great songs in it. And even though the songs in this are pretty lackluster and none of them are going to send you out tapping your toes— there's a sweet kind of movie stars do karaoke quality that put me in mind of a movie like Mamma Mia, right, where somebody who can't necessarily sing nonetheless puts over a not necessarily that great rendition of a song. But no, 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 I've got to make more of a difference here. There's so much left to do with all the trolls and a-holes out there. Well, am I doing the world a world of good? And am I giving it my all? I can point to so many problems with it. Mm. But in the end, it kind of won me over. Oh, man. I think Dana just refined my sense of why I hated this, not to preview my feelings. But Julia, that makes me very curious to know where you're going to land. Ooh, I'm excited to get to your hatred, Steve. My response to this movie was 100% grading on a curve. Like I was looking at it in the year after the musical officially was killed once and for all because of the terrible box office for West Side Story and In the Heights and all, you know, like, like the notion of Hollywood spending $75 million to get a bunch of extras to like dance unendingly, enthusiastically, Busby Berkeley-ishly behind Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds while they gamely attempt to croon and, you know, put on their best Gene Kelly's, uh, which aren't that good, but are sort of charming for the gusto that they bring to it. <laughs> um, kind of won me over. And the and the brio that they bring to the world building the the robust cast of characters, the, the amusing acting and casting choices for Christmas past and Christmas yet to come. You know, Octavia Spencer has a wonderful bit role in which she gets to play a romantic lead, which I love the way they cast her here. There's just so much that's winning about it and so much that's unexpected. There's an entire set piece that posits that the term good afternoon was a woeful <laughs> insult in like in victorian london and has like little smut-faced dervishes like popping out of drain pipes to shout good afternoon like i was charmed um but then it went on about 45 minutes too long and i think as charming as the casting is around farrell and reynolds there's um something a little bit unsatisfying about the arc for these two leading men that i want to circle back around to but um I was like, why not? Why not let Ryan Reynolds dance on a conventioneer table? Love it. Mm-hmm. All right, Steve, unleash unleash the hate. Sure, but let me start with a couple of things I admired about it. Not 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 loved, but admired. The the first is that there's actually something hidden in plain sight and very clever at the center of this, which is that what made Scrooge the original Scrooge hateful 
he was a miser, right? The heyday of gold and 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 the hoarding of an overpricing of gold, the kind of semi primitive, semi advanced stage of capitalism, right? It's like mindless. I mean, Keynes, the economist, very famously said, "Why, why would you spend your life attempting to collect and amass something and then you bury it?" So, funnily enough, what I admired about this most of all is, well, the modern equivalent isn't a hoarder, right? If you're trying to make a a hyper capitalist neoliberal supervillain to go with or not be the analog be our analog for the victorian hoarder gold hoarder um he is a consultant right he's a person of zero loyalties he hoards nothing right he just gives himself away to others in order to do their their dirty business for them and leave them with semi-clean consciences in some sense. I mean, he's sort of the horrible McKinsey. He's the embodiment of McKinsey and Paul Manafort. And, you know, I mean, it's 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 the person whose amorality goes to the service of making other people triumph in some way. And everyone walks away clean because, you know, he's just a, he's just a client server and the person whose bidding he's doing is, you know, has paid him to do it and then go away. I mean, it's just, it is a perfect modern update, postmodern update of this type. I like that a lot. The other thing I liked was, and I don't want to spoil it, but there are these twists that I thought, okay, that's that's quite clever, right? There's, you know, when you find out um, the details of um, of Will Ferrell's, you know, um, the Ghost of Christmas Present's actual mortal life and why he might long to return to a fleshly, um, but ultimately doomed existence. I thought that was actually quite nicely done. In execution, I found this grating in the absolute extreme. I mean, it. It part of the problem is there was something like legitimately horrifying being shown the original Scrooge, right? Like the its power derives from this idea that you've been this revolting human being, and all you've done is create misery around uh, around the, in the people around you and here's the thing you don't realize and this is i think what would be most horrifying about watching your own life unfold in stages from a third person point of view the person you ultimately immiserated was yourself right the person you ultimately impoverished was yourself look at this shriveled old crone you've become out of this young man and child that you were and all you've attempted to do is foist your losses on those around you and you cannot stop internalizing them and it's only by i mean it's like kind of a version of therapy right it's like you will bring someone around to seeing the ways in which they've made themselves miserable i just felt like this was lacking in this this didn't get it didn't by making the afterlife a kind of fun musical number with like kind of corporate and antiseptic in a way, it made me understand why people would want to escape it, but it didn't make me understand, you know, why this was an important morality tale to revive in this context exactly. And then just very quickly, um, you know, it also doesn't seem to get what made Elf such an enduring classic. Like Favreau and, and Farrell put so much whimsy into this premise of this oafish I mean, and that's what Farrell is so good at. He's so unembarrassedly oafish as a performer who thinks he's an elf. And it's just like all of this magic flows for, forth from that premise, Dana. And here I was like, uh, they're just like, they're, it's forced. That's the word. It's forced. And like forced whimsy at $75 million a pop, not my holiday jam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, Julie, to talk about grading on a curve, if you're going to compare this to Elf, which is one of the mm-hmm. holiday classics of our time, Uncurable. right? Then you can either sort of say this is riding the coattails of Elf energy, you know, Very, and bringing yeah, a I little thought. bit of that. If you love Will Ferrell, and how can you not? Um, or you can say that compared to Elf, this is just a, a sad shadow of, of what it could have been. I don't know. Am I just tr- am I just trying too hard and straining too hard to feel the holiday spirit? Like this is pretty mediocre. But the fact <laughs> straight away, <laughs> but on all our behalf, the presence of Will Ferrell to me elevated it to a certain degree. He actually yes. can put over a song oh, as absolutely. he has proven in you know the Eurovision Song Contest movie and Blades of Glory. Like there's a side of him that is officially enough a kind of musical comedy. Performance. Former. Totally agree. And I wish that there was a little bit more focus on him. Um, but honestly, Ryan Reynolds is perfect for this kind of role, what you're talking about, the soulless McKinsey consultant, right? I mean, he's got yeah, a lot of haters out there, yep. but he is kind of playing on that persona, you know, on his persona as a um, 
as a handy, handsome plug-in corporate presence in, in so many Hollywood movies. This, this does come back to what I was going to try to say about the leading men. I mean, you're right. Will Ferrell, part of why Will Ferrell is great, unexpectedly great at singing is that the key to his whole comedic persona is just an unabashed willingness to commit, which you think would be true of any performer. All comedians always have to act crazy and pretend it's normal, but like more than anybody I can think of who's in our comedic Valhalla, he he will go there so hard and stay there. <laughs> and so I think that's part of what makes him work <laughs> so, so well in, in the musical genre. But this is where I think the souffle of the film collapsed a little bit for me is in the way in which it engaged with, with the Ryan Reynolds persona. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, one of the things I thought watching this and I watched the first half of it with my children and I was like, this is so nice to, to like, there aren't that many movies like this that I can watch with my children that are designed to be, we watched with children that are fundamentally explicit, if slightly heavy handed in the hands of these lyricist morality plays. Right. Like, you know, it's a, it's a parable about being good, making good choices. Mm. It felt like wholesome, right. To show them in a way that was just very earnest and very sincere, but the Ryan Reynolds persona, which is very McKinsey, which is very glib and slick and glossy, like the, the structure that the film attempts, which is that you're looking at redemption arcs for both Will Ferrell and for Ryan Reynolds, to me, sort of knocks out the moral point of Scrooge. Like we spend more time watching Will Ferrell, who's already committed his life to making people be good, recommit to still being good in various ways. And then we kind of slide right past Ryan Reynolds' mm -hmm. redemption, which happens so quickly. Sorry, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to count as a spoiler that it happens in this movie, guys. <laughs> I, I just, Fair. Like, you might get jerked around a little bit about whether or when it's going to happen, but guess what? It does. But it happens so glibly. It happens just as glibly as the personas that he plays. And I actually think to to fully go full Dickens, you'd have to actually spend more time patiently unlocking that that carapace of of slick unthinkingness. And so that kind of, that's that's what made me feel like this is only mediocre and not not headed for the elf pantheon by a mm. long shot. All right. Well, the movie is spirited. It's on Apple TV Plus streaming. It's uh, also is in movie theaters for about a one week window. It might be wrapping up by the time you hear this. But anyway, if you do check it out, as always, we love your feedback and your thoughts. So shoot them to us. All right, let's move on. This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. This year, let Best Buy be your holiday hype partner. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts, trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, or looking for ways to simplify the giving and receiving experience, Best Buy is here to help. Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them, with free next-day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same-day delivery and in-store pickup options. Make Best Buy your go-to gifting destination this holiday season for products that help you enjoy what really matters, like my family's tradition of settling down after all the gifts are opened and all the dinners are eaten to watch a really great movie together. Usually a movie of my choice because by the week between Christmas and New Year's, I've pretty much seen all the year's movies and have some favorites and things that I want to show to my family. So I have some really nice Christmas memories of settling down with our holiday dessert in our lap and forcing my family, lovingly forcing them to watch the movies that were my favorite movies of that year. No matter what your plans may be this holiday season, Best Buy is the perfect destination for all your holiday needs. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. All right, before we go any further, this is uh, where we discuss business. Dana, what do you have? Stephen, first and most important item of business, we want to remind everyone about our upcoming listener call-in episode. This is our annual tradition around holiday time where we construct a whole episode around your questions, questions about culture, questions about politics, questions about our favorite colors, questions about whatever you want. We pick our favorite questions from your list and we answer them during this special episode, which usually airs the last week of the year or the first week of the new year, depending when we get the questions and when we can all with our holiday schedules get together and answer them. So if there's anything that you have been dying to ask me, Steve and Julia, you can call us and leave us a message at 908-977-6807. Once again, that's 908 977 
There's a voicemail box at that number where you can tell us our question and maybe we'll play it on the show. Or you can email it to us, as always, at culturefest at slate.com. I'm also going to take advantage of this business segment to let Bay Area listeners know, and we talked about this a couple months ago, now it's it's coming close, that I am coming to Berkeley, to the Pacific Film Archive, which is part of the Berkeley Art Museum, uh, and which is also the place when I was a grad student at Berkeley that I got much of my film education because it's an incredible, incredible theater and cinematic archive and just resource for film lovers. And the Pacific Film Archive has very kindly invited me to do a whole series. It's actually a two-week-long series of films based on my book, Cameraman. So it's Buster Keaton movies, but they are also showing films by lots of other creators I talk about in the book, including Roscoe Arbuckle, Mabel Normand, Burt Williams. There's a Samuel Beckett movie in there. If you've read the book, you know that these are all characters who crisscrossed with Buster Keaton in his life and who I write about. And uh, and the PFA is programming a whole series around it. In fact, it's already started, but I myself am going to be there next week introducing three of the seven evenings that, that they're having around the book and signing books and uh, giving talks and various other things. So we'll put the link on the show page. But if you live somewhere in the San Francisco Bay Area, please come see me in Berkeley next week. That's really cool. Yeah, there's been a lot of fun stuff that's happened this year. But honestly, this one feels like old home week to me. And I'm just really, really excited at that. They are so extensively invested in, you know, investigating the films mentioned in the book. And finally, to wrap up our business segment, I'll tell you about today's Slate Plus segment. As you know, we have a whole holiday-themed show this week, so our Slate Plus segment is holiday-themed as well. It was actually me that came up with the idea, I think. I wanted to know, for Steve and Julia, when does the holiday season begin in your mind? When does the holiday spirit, for whatever version of the holidays you celebrate, first descend on you, and what makes that happen? So if you're a Slate Plus member, you can hear that segment at the end of this show. And if you are not, you can sign up at slate.com slash culture plus. When you sign up for Slate Plus, you get ad free podcasts. You get bonus content like that segment I just described and lots of other shows have them, too. And of course, you get unlimited access to all of the writing on Slate. When you become a Slate Plus member, you will never hit a paywall and you will be supporting us, our work and the work of our wonderful colleagues. These memberships are really important for Slate. So please sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. Once again, that's slate.com slash culture plus. All right, Steve, let's get Mary. All right. Well, Matt Rogers is a comedian, actor, podcaster, writer, now certainly songster extraordinaire. And uh, Showtime has had, has the very good sense to have given him an hour-long special with which to work his perverse magic into and all over Christmas. Have you heard of Christmas as a kind of in a cabaret format? It's a Joe filmed live at Joe's pub, but it also has pre-recorded sketches interspersed uh, all over it between original songs and hilariously ditzy but knowing monologues. Uh, nominally the kind of storyline of the sketches especially is about Matt's attempt to relaunch himself as a pop star with a like very Mariah Carey-esque Christmas or holiday hit. But it's really, I think, in the end, a campy and in its way soulful meditation on the meaning of the holiday season. Uh, here's a clip that's from the title track, Have You Heard of Christmas, in which Matt struggles to remember exactly what Christmas is actually about. Heads up, okay, earmuffs, there's some risky language up ahead. Let's listen. Have you heard of Christmas? It's when Moses did the lake. Have you heard of Christmas? That was the night that they made St. Nick a saint. Have you heard of Christmas? That's when Noah built his boat. Have you heard of Christmas? It's when you see that cousin that you want to fuck, but you don't. Sometimes it can feel like you don't know what Christmas is at all. Christmas is. <laughs> <laughs> <At all. laughs> I mean, the it's like one of the rare things where he like dropped the mic on all our behalves, right? Like the idea that we're now going to talk about this for 15, 12, 15 minutes is so preposterous. But Julia, I got to throw that hot potato right at you. I can't hide it. I cherished this. And uh, please tell me your uh, team, Matt, here. Ooh, Ooh. I came away from this special very team, Matt. 
and not very team this special. It just didn't make me laugh very much. It seemed, um, I admired its chutzpah. I admired its charm. I admired his charm. There are a few songs that made me laugh. The one we just played is one of them. And the other one is the one that takes on the persona of the only single adult woman in Whoville. Uh, and it's a uh, kind of very raunchy sex ballad. Uh, and it's probably worth playing a brief clip of it here. That had me in stitches. But for, for most of the time, I found myself in this awkward position of like really rooting for this likable comic to make me laugh and then just not laughing. So wow. I'm probably not the right person to sing the praises of this. It, it felt so strained to me. Um, and I'm more interested in hearing the critical views of, of you guys who liked it more. And perhaps they'll help me unpack my oh, man. Am I, inert response. Am I out there all alone in the North Atlantic on an ice floe loving this with all my <laughs> heart alone? <laughs> Dana, fucking life I vest. mean, I, I think maybe your ice floe is a little further out than mine. <laughs> I would not say that I loved it with all my heart. I, what I would say that is that this movie especially in the in the live performance segments mm. i was not so crazy about the framing segment i wasn't sure that that worked in translating um the, the energy of the live show but everything that's taped at joe's pub like the song clip that we that we kicked off with uh i it really to me captures the the magic of being at an extremely yes. goofy um cabaret show you know and it kind of made me get the Matt Rogers, Bo and Yang thing mm-hmm. for the first time as podcasters. Their podcast, Las Culturistas, is something that's constantly on in my household because my theater nerd <laughs> daughter listens to it. In fact, she wants to watch this Christmas special with me. She hasn't yet. But um, essentially, Matt and Bowen together are these... Bowen makes a small appearance in this, but uh, but it's mainly the Matt Rogers show there on stage. And uh, and when they're together, the energy is wonderful. It makes me understand why my drama nerd daughter is so plugged into these two snarky gay theater nerd podcasts um, and it's just a world that uh, that is so vibrant, I'm sure, when you're on the stage watching it in person. It really has the feeling almost of, uh, I mean, obviously it couldn't be improv because these songs had to be written and orchestrated in oh, advance. Yeah. But it very much has the feeling in a lot of these songs like you're following the journey of a sketch, right? They're sketches and songs at the same time. And that's just not something you see a lot of on TV. It's something you basically yeah. have to go to places like Joe's Pub and, you know, various cabaret locations in cities to watch uh, people goof on stage in that way. So even though it didn't translate perfectly to the one hour Christmas special format, I still felt like I was getting a glimpse of, of a kind of a wonderful world of, you know, gay theatrical song parodies. I'm shocked by both of your responses because I was m- mystified by the opening number. I It took me a second to recognize him as the actor in in Fire Island. Um, and, uh, and then the sketches... I got hooked on the pre-recorded sketch material from the first one, just this clueless star persona he's inhabiting that's himself but not himself. It's his worst self and his funniest, weirdest, most caustic and narcissistic self at the same time. Made me laugh so hard right away. And I thought it was sharp, sharp, sharp writing, writing, sketch writing. And the preposterous MacGuffin of he's on this quest to relaunch himself as a pop star with no background in music um, and wants to start it with the thing you typically do mid or late career, which is a a holiday song a la Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas and on and on and on. As you've been made aware over an all caps email that I sent you all, we're going to be pivoting from comedy and acting to recording artists. I think we can all agree that's going to be a lot easier. I just, he had me laughing and then, and then... I really warmed up to the kind of cabaret live stuff and I suddenly felt like I was in the room. And here's what I loved about it most and then I'll I'll punt it back to you. But, you know, the tradition of camp, as I understand it, which may not be at all, but it's sort of inhabiting a thing fully while also sort of standing completely outside it and finding it preposterous. He took that, I thought, to an absolutely extreme direction over the arc of the whole thing, culminating in a song that I really loved, which is both the totally sour undercutting of a tribute to your own parents and a tribute to his parents. And he claims 
after the fact. He claims that he was really crying. And yet it's this total explosion of the of like what it is you love about your parents and how you realize it on Christmas, which is that they make it fucking rain. Oh, my God. The song to his parents. (laughs) Right. It starts off really (laughs) sentimental and it cuts to his actual parents in the audience. And it's near the end. So you think he's turning sincere now. And then the line he keeps singing about cut me that fat fucking check. (laughs) You still make it rain. You always caught that fat fucking check for me. <laughs> it's so. Julia, come on. Oh, I was rooting for it so much. Oh. I wished I was in stitches the whole time, and I was just like, I get what he's doing here. This is a funny idea. Good oh. job having a funny idea. I just, I don't know. I don't know if it was Julia needs a mug mind. of spiked eggnog in her hand to Thank enjoy you. this show. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I it, it like I would say my main takeaway is that I need to start listening to less culturistas. Like I was like, I want to be more in Matt Rogers' presence, just yeah. not when he's doing this. <laughs> but I will say. One of the things that I admired about it was its approach to describing the emotional landscape of an actual Christmas. Like mm. most Christmas specials are about the fantasy of Christmas, right? They're about tw- twinkling snow and caroling and cookies. And, you know, one of my absolute favorite numbers from a parody Christmas special, which is that a category? I don't know, but I'm sure I've endorsed on the show before. But uh, Stephen Colbert did a kind of faux Christmas special, I don't know, more than a decade ago, in which John Legend swings by in kind of like a smoky bear forest ranger outfit and sings an incredibly lewd song about the importance of putting nutmeg in your eggnog. <laughs> Girl, I'm gonna rock you like a cradle. You lick the nutmeg off my ladle. It's pure as fire. Literally every single line of that song causes me to like roll off of the couch onto the floor and pause it to die laughing. And I was looking for that level of hilarity. So, you know, I I did not think these songs were that funny, but they're about like the actual emotional contours of the holiday as it is currently observed, which is what the hell is it about religiously? Don't know. Like, hmm. why are we all watching the Grinch and it's it, it's weirdness? Um, wow, that takes up a lot of psychic space. Um, you know, there's a great song in which he brings on a couple of fellow comedians to sing about uh, going home for Christmas queer and sort of how your family responds to you, you know, in, in different types of families. That's really, I thought, was one of the strongest numbers. Um, and we sort of both moving about that moment for people and then also like baroque and extreme and have all kinds of, of funny comic extremes latched onto it even if they try to tell you donald trump is still president and they do if you pop off and they kick you out i'ma have you back oh girl that makes me feel so good you are my support system please plan the perceptiveness of his approach to the emotional contours of the modern holiday as it is rather than as the fantasy assumes it to be was one of the things that i thought was smart and fun and fresh about this it's yeah. more than just dirty songs about eggnog yeah i mean it made me think also of this year we've had fire island and bros right two different queer mm. rom-coms that kind of try to to queer those tropes i kind of feel like the this special especially that song and a couple other moments in it did that more effectively than either of those two movies all right well it's called have you heard of christmas we seem to have affection for it though we're a little split on how deep that affection runs so uh check it out and um shoot us an email i'd love to know all right let's move on all right well julia i'm gonna start with you tis the season (laughs) you know speaking i think kind of agnostically non-denominationally non-sectarianly there are a lot of holiday traditions that people have a wide variety of feelings about i imagine both being on the receiving end of christmas cards paper, digital, what have you, or and or being obliged to then send them out. You know, that's one of those rituals that I think some people seem to take in an inordinate amount of meaning from 
to be on both ends of the transaction and other people such as perhaps me, none whatsoever. Where where do you fall on this? What's your holiday card ritual? Do you have a kind of larger uh, uh, philosophy about this? Um, I don't know if I have a philosophy. I think I have a question. So mm, okay. I grew I grew up in a household that did not send holiday cards, but like many households, we received a bunch of holiday cards. And I always loved when we did. Like I, I really enjoyed looking at them in my parents' mail and seeing the random friends of theirs that I knew and knew their kids well. And then seeing all these random people I'd never heard of from some past lives of my parents. And sometimes those people would you know, you know, there's the holiday card that identifies the children by name helpfully, and then the one that just assumes you remember what the names and ages of all their children are. And I don't know, I remember just finding them these like really interesting little texts mm. as a child, like going through my parents' stack of these. Um, but also feeling like, oh, we were we're not a family that does this. And then when I grew up, I just started sending them. Like I enjoyed getting them from my friends. It seemed like kind of a funny right of pat you know at that moment where if you have kids when you have kids it really does suggest to you like oh well fuck i guess i'm a grown up now um you know and i started getting i think often the sending of them is prompted by having children and sharing wanting to share news of and pictures of the children and i started sending a new year's card many years not all years it's very it's new year's because it ends up being like late and a day late and a dollar short and when i get my shit together to do it and also i don't know new year's feels like a better non-denominational thing to wish people like Mm -hmm. i do wish everyone i love to have a a good year ahead and i do enjoy the new year's time of like fresh start clean snow like let's all hope things go well this year um and so my question is how did i become a person who sends holiday cards because when i think about it you know in, in as a form like in my brain they have like the same problem as like writing into the class notes of your alumni magazine. <laughs> like there's, there's a bit of a quality of like, look at the prize pumpkins I've grown. Yeah. Like, look, they're bigger this year. Yep. And then there's a little bit of the chauvinism of the parent. Like, well, I've procreated. What have you done? Like, I'm not sure I like them, what they could signify, but I just enjoy them. I enjoy getting them. I enjoy hearing from my friends. I enjoy seeing the pictures they choose and the tone they strike. And sometimes they're very classic and sometimes people try to play with the form. So I don't know. I guess my question to you guys is, am I crazy slash a bad person for really enjoying both receiving and sending home cards? <laughs> that went in a direction I wasn't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Dana, what's, uh, what, what's, how do you feel about the state of Julia's soul now that you know that she <laughs> indulges in this? Do you need to get Will Ferrell in here to keep me from sending home cards? <laughs> no, actually, Julia, when you describe it as, as something that you're ambivalent about, I feel like I want to vote for you to keep on doing it because while we can debate, you know, the the value or the joy or the oppressiveness of the tradition of having to send a card, I love that you want to send a card. And actually, of the people that send me holiday cards with your with their kids on them, I have to say that yours have the longest life because the horrible thing about the printed holiday card with someone's kid is that there is some moment in the new year where it goes in the recycling bin. Mm. <laughs> and their beaming, <laughs> lovely little faces just get, you know, tossed in with the with the old wrappers or whatever. And Julia, there is actually a picture of your boys when, when they were maybe three or four on the holiday card where they have chocolate on their faces that I cut out <laughs> and stuck up on the inside of a cabinet where we keep sort of, you know, some precious pictures and little family tidbits and things like that. And so Aww. when I think of your sons, they are still the little chubby beaming faces from a holiday card from probably, I don't know, six years ago or something like that. Um <laughs> But it would never occur to me to do the printed holiday card, both because it seems like I don't want my own kid to end up in a recycling bin, especially immediately, (laughs) Um, and and for somebody to dread having to respond to or or deal with that, Um, and just because there's too much else going on at holiday time for me to prioritize that. But 
I think I do depend on that superstructure existing, that somebody is going to send out pictures of their kids so that I can have that little mantelpiece moment. We don't keep them on the mantelpiece, but there is a specific kind of tall dresser that becomes the home for holiday cards. And it's nice to have them up there. It's part of the clutter of Christmas to look up and say, oh, our upstairs neighbors who moved away and we haven't seen them in eight years, you know, now have kids Mm. in middle school. So that sense that, you know, time is passing and somebody is keeping you abreast of it with the printed kid pictures is great. Um, Even a card without kid pictures, just, you know, to sort of add to your decorations is nice. Uh, But insofar as it's a probably for a lot of those people, something that they feel they have to do. And maybe they're grumpily licking stamps and sending the things out because it's just the thing that's done. I would want them to liberate themselves from that oppression. Mm, This is this this discussion raises so many questions. But the first really primary one is why is Dana on your holiday mailing list and not Steve Metcalf, Julia? (laughs) You are on my list. Am I? I don't know who's drawing out your cards. Yeah, I've been sending you cards for years. (laughs) Okay. Mem- memorably <laughs> straight into the shredder they go <laughs> into the, into the kindling for your, yeah. for your, uh, those little oh, chocolate faces whoopsie, Steve whoopsie never daisy. glimpsed them we'll, uh, we'll cut that um, anyway so and then the next question is well I, I, I have to ask right because I'm the person or the family that would never consider doing it right so it is interesting to me that you know, your parents, Julia, being of a certain generation, just didn't, it sounds like, didn't even consider doing it or whatever. It was just a non-issue. Of course, we're not going to do it. And that's the way I feel to a degree that's so unconscious and so automated. I've never examined it. Do you have a sense of why your family didn't, you know, your your parents didn't do this? I don't know. Two working parents. And mm. I will say the technology of sending them is much easier right, right now. Like, right. You, you know, I'm, I'm all hooked up and minted and they, all the addresses are in there and they automatically get printed. And like, the, you know, I bloop the photos over from my iPhone. Like you can get it done with no glue sticks, no tape, no trip to the like, where would you even go? Like you'd go to the CVS to print your photos. Like how would you even do one in 1986? Yeah. It seems like a huge pain in the butt. I mean, I, I guess another thing that occurs to me is that in the age of like, Facebook, and if you've, like me, long since gotten rid of Facebook, like Google stalking or whatever, it's like people don't have, I mean, within reason, people don't have to totally disappear from your ken, as it were, you know, you know, if it's been years and years, you can kind of look just by way of a little bit of background. So I grew up in a household where, for better and for worse, right, if something was put in a certain place or existed in a certain place. It was never not in that place, right? It was like an incredibly orderly, changeless environment that I grew up in. And um, yeah. and so Christmas was special in the sense that it was a time of also orderly, but kind of change and, and by the standards of the other 364 days, you know, disarray, creative disarray, and also child centricness that was also and my parents were kind of modern victorians in some respects and so there was this you know way in which it truly was an exceptional day right it was just nothing was like what it was and the earliest preview of this coming kind of to us hallowed 24 hours was um were the arrival of these christmas cards and my my parents were sort of oddly social in in a very old-fashioned sense people you know wide circles of acquaintanceship relatively well maintained even though you don't actually see the people uh, uh, you know um beyond a, a much smaller circle or whatever and so there'd be and of course my mother sent them too but but and they would immediately begin going up on these bookshelves you know and the bookshelves were also sort of of a piece of the um you know, changelessness and kind of, I don't know, I I don't know, sort of slightly behind a glass case quality of the way my parents lived in that they were sort of old leather, gilt lettered editions that were sort of collectible, but not really. I mean, they they weren't ultimately super valuable, but they were ye olde and had never been cracked, right? I mean, they weren't exclusively that, but that was a lot of their bookshelves. And then a lot of other books that, you know, hadn't whatever i mean so suddenly and they had knew so many people that these rather extensive built-in shelves in their living room 
you know, within a week or two and with still, you know, two or three weeks to go before Christmas, you know. And so they had like this pregnant with symbolism. But I guess I was sort of determined, Dana, to create a household that was the total antithetical refutation of everything my parents had done. <laughs> and that includes rituals like this. So I wonder if I've like deprived my children or something. But did, do you have like sort of emotionally resonant associations with this or... Wow, that makes me really glad we talked about this topic, Steve, because that's such a that's such a resonant image of your childhood of the very staid bookshelf suddenly turning into this riot mm-hmm. of, you know, sparkly cards and yeah. letters. I don't have anything to compare with that. I think that probably Julia and I were talking about this in, in deciding to do this segment that she and I come from similar uh, non-religious but vaguely protestant backgrounds and are both Mm -hmm. married to secular Jews, (laughs) you know, and we have a similar holiday mishmash happening in our own houses. But Julia's right. It's it's hard for me to imagine that turning into a a tradition that I would want (laughs) to put forth to others. And and, and maybe, maybe that's wrong. Maybe I should be more adult in that way and be creating a tradition for my daughter and for the people that know us out in the outside Mm -hmm. world so that they, you know, their house, maybe their overly orderly house turns into some sparkly chaos. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I'm just... I'm both too secular, too lazy, and maybe a little too afraid of um, of seeming like one of those braggy Christmas parents yeah. to quite do it. I mean, the the worst corollary, and we haven't talked about this yet, but it was the first thing that sprung to mind when we were talking about the, the tradition of sending out cards. Um, the worst corollary of this tradition to me is the Christmas letter, which we get one of every year. Actually, this would be more of a Hanukkah letter because it's from a Jewish branch of the family. And I'm sure this person doesn't listen to the podcast and they're a distant relative, so I can say it. It is the most status hungry, kind of prestige obsessed, you know, full typed page addressed, you know, on en masse to groups of people that's all about like so and so finished their medical residency and this person terrible, has a right? cheerleading trophy. And there's nothing at all about sort of like, joy and love and, and humor or, or you know, any sort of failing that the family might have struggled through. It's just this very sad sort of almost corporate tone, yeah. like, here's why we're a good family we, this we year. We got one of those every year. And, it's uh, so funny and, you it, say I that. mean, I guess in, in, I in, in a way say. that's an occasion for merriment because we always mock yes, the letter. we did that but, too. <laughs> but it's ultimately a very sad well, that tradition. Is, that is true. Okay, okay. You guys are making me come around to like a deep defense of, of, the, of the holiday card. So first of all, do not throw out the Christmas letter with the status hungry bathwater because my favorite Christmas card every year is from this wonderful family we know who has, um, it's just a beautiful piece of writing and it is reflective and it does talk about failures and it talks honestly about their growth and their kids' growth and the politics of the world. But it's like a meaningful update of like what is going on in their lives. And I think the thing I enjoy about these letters, like, or these cards, you know, as you say, Steve, we can all, we all know what everybody's doing. Anybody you want to know what they're doing, you poke around on two or three apps. It's like very hard for someone to disappear. You know, there's like a couple people in my life that I'm like, I wonder where they are. And I like can't immediately like locate where they are if I ever have that feeling. Right. It's something about the push of it. You know, it's not a passive receptive like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all got this huge web. I know you're out there somewhere. It's this push of like, I am here. I, I know you. I love you on some level in some way. And I want to share with you glad tidings and like a little bit of an update on where I am in the world mentally. I really enjoy it. I like it. I like when yeah. it happens. And I also, I do not think of it as an obligation. Like right. to me, it's all gravy. Like, oh, yay, this family sent me one. But I'm not like, where's Dana's right. Christmas card? <laughs> like, well, how come I haven't heard from the Metcalfs this year? It's like, <laughs> no, you do you, whatever, whatever exactly. works for anybody. Yeah, very cool. I would say that that, that was Lovely. And can I give you a very quick, if it's, it's all right, portentous Dickensian coda to this discussion? So sure. do you want to know what happens when this uh, Christmas card ritual comes up against a, a, a father who lives until he's just shy of his 97th birthday? Every year, a few more begin to disappear because he outlives everyone until none arrive really like one or two up there attacked in the same way that they were when there were 100 or 120 or whatever it was so it's it's a haunting way to measure 
a person's longevity if they've been part of a ritual like that and display it. But anyway, all right. This is one of those ones where um, we really, we, I, when I say it, I always mean it, but I really mean it now. Like shoot us an email. We'd love to hear um, whether this is something you do or don't do. And uh, let's keep the dialogue going. All right. Well, now is the moment in our podcast when we endorse Dana. What do you have? All right. So as I mentioned, when we talked about the Matt Rogers special, Have You Heard of Christmas? I was not so crazy about the framing device um, in which he, for the most part, this consists of Matt Rogers sitting around with his team of publicists and consultants about whether they can get Mariah Carey to join the show or not. Part of the reason I was frustrated with this frame story is that one of the actresses playing a bit part in that in those scenes is essentially a patron saint of performance in our household. And the fact that she was on a show full of live singing on stage and did not perform a song was one of the disappointments Mm. of the show for me. And if my daughter, my last Cole Teresa's loving daughter, does watch this show, her big complaint is going to be that Natalie Walker, who plays the publicist who ultimately says Mariah Carey is not doing the show, (laughs) Uh, she's the brunette with the kind of angular features, is this wonderful actress, singer, stage performer who's kind of on the same scene as the Las Culturistas guys. She does cabaret. She has appeared in off-Broadway plays. I don't know why she is not a huge star because she is extraordinary. So I want to send people, this is your Christmas gift for me, down the Natalie Walker rabbit hole online. And a good place to start is with a performance of Cabaret, the song Cabaret, that she did in a bar... I believe it was part of a whole staging of the whole show in this bar where they sort of moved around the bar as if it were their stage. I'm not sure because I wasn't at the performance, but it was in 2018. And there's a two minute clip of her singing the song Cabaret Mm -hmm. as Sally Bowles uh, that is really, really extraordinary. She plays Sally Bowles as a I don't know how to describe it, but her Sally Bowles is this really fragile, mentally unstable woman who's sort of falling apart as she sings the song. It's a total deconstruction of cabaret. There's only two minutes of it online, but it's connected to a lot of other clips. Once you watch that one, you will want to watch more performances, and you can go down the uh, the YouTube rabbit hole and find various clips of her singing duets and solos, etc. Anyway, just keep your eye on Natalie Walker and uh, and start off with Cabaret. She is so funny in her bit part in the special. Oh my God, but she needed more to yeah. do. She's, she is extraordinary. I've, we've seen her a few times now, three or four times, uh, doing just live solo or, or duet Cabaret shows, and she just, she can hold an entire audience in the palm of her hand. She's an extraordinary performer. Yeah. Um, Julia, what do you have? I have a really exciting announcement for Culture Fest listeners. When I say the phrase mouse architect, what do you guys think? You're the, the book that <laughs> drew all of the extraordinary, you know, humanness of Julia Turner to the surface into a hot mic and sent it into a hot mic. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the book Need a House, Call Miss Mouse, which is like my favorite childhood picture book, which I... Um, described while laughing so hard I cried as though I was hallucinatorily remembering a dream because I hadn't thought of it in so long. And I think we did a listener question call and show 10 odd, 10 odd years ago where I was like, my favorite book was about this fictional mouse architect. And then I died laughing and you guys died laughing. And the book was long out of print and copies of it were going on eight Libras for $400. And I found an Australian design writer who'd written an essay about how wonderful the book was, which we, in Design Observer, which we republished in Slate, some of the images. So about 10 years ago, you know, I I brought this tome to the surface. For some reason this year, the book is being re-released in both Australia and in the United States. In the U.S., it's being re-released by the New York Review of Books Press, um, and in Australia by Allen and Unwin. Um, and I have a copy of the Australian edition here, which which someone sent to me. And it does include a slate quote on the back, which thankfully is an excerpt from the from the well-written Design Observer essay and not a sentence of me like laugh snorting into <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad that this book is going to be available. And um, I, do, I don't know exactly how it happened. I know actually that we at Slate looked into the state of the rights and whether we could prompt a reprint of the book 10 years ago. And we were unable to do so because the rights were tangled up in some fashion. 
Um, but somebody untangled them in multiple venues. So uh, hop on out and uh, purchase Need a House, Call Miss Mouse for your own delectation or for the delectation of young readers near you. Uh, I'm so thrilled that this book will be available to the world. And if you get it, please send a note at culturefest at site.com and tell me which animal home you most want to live in. I'm still torn between the fox and the otter. Uh, and maybe the bear. So let me know. First of all, I'm 100% ordering that book. And secondly, Julia, this is clearly in part your doing. I I really believe that you weeping about your memories of this out-of-print children's book on our show (laughs) probably a decade ago had started some butterfly effect that has led to various people looking for it, asking for it, Googling it, and gradually convinced Australian and American publishers to reprint the book again. I, I second that. Well, I very much enjoy that suppositional approach to publishing history. As I said, we did make an inquiry about the rights, so perhaps that set some process in motion. But however it happened, Need a House, Call Ms. Mouth is now available to you in the U.S. and Australia. And I should note here that it is written by George Mendoza and has beautiful illustrations by Doris Susan Smith. So immerse yourself. Oh, that's great. Okay, well, this is one of the weirder endorsements I think I've ever... Uh, dropped and and it it it's as much about your reaction, both of your reactions, which I'm kind of dying to get in a way. Um, but <laughs> I'm endorsing Lana Del Rey, and here's okay. here's why I'm endorsing Lana Del Rey. My kids are obsessed. Um, I've certainly heard plenty of Lana Del Rey over the years. I like Lana Del Rey's music already, and had. I don't know, it's maybe half a dozen songs of hers on a on a you know huge playlist, playlist of twelve hundred songs now. But that woman is a genius. I think she is so weirdly underrated as an artist. I mean, I know she's a huge star, and I'm sure that there are already masters and PhD theses on her persona and its bizarre kind of real, not real concoction. And I just think I think she's done something extraordinary ordinary, right? As a pop star, right? She sort of created this fake thing that she is. It seems to have extraordinary amounts of darkness and brokenness in it. Um, It's like so guarded and protected and withheld and so on the sleeve and lacrimose and self-pitying. It's like, and by the way, I think the craft of the song Songs are extraordinary. I think the the deafness of the lyrics is extraordinary. And I think she joins a list of artists who manage to get deep, deep, deep into the weird shallows of the American character. I, I think there's something special happening in her music. I've never seen Dana with that much of a get get your shit out of here <laughs> <laughs> and away from me. Look at her face. No, I'm just trying to think of the last album of hers that we talked about. It was Norman fucking Rockwell, yeah, right? Yeah, which is a great, it's a great fucking record. It really is. It I grew do, on I, I me. don't quite concur. <laughs> 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 but we did a segment on it already. I just remember finding her songwriting ticks oh. in that to be somewhat irritating and that the piling up of references was sometimes as I remember, leaning on the greatness of the lyrics that she was it's paraphrasing not, rather than her own. It's not, though. That's like this weird bric a brac magpie thing that she's doing in a couple of those songs. I think actually to quite, you know, cunning purpose in some sense. Like, How to Disappear. Just listen to the song How to Disappear. How to Disappear is a, Julia, a fucking amazing, amazing song. Yes, no, maybe, or get that shit out of here. No, I, I, oh man, she's not, she's, she's just not like strutty enough. No. I did no. my Spotify wrapped happened last week and, um, they told me that my midday vibe was upbeat, curious, nervous. <laughs> I was like, oh, is that what strut is? I was like, nervous is a little weird there, guys. Um, I just am not like a mopey, uh, like not mopey, moody ballad. Like moody ballads, right. just not my jam. So I kind of <laughs> like. A dirge I, gal. I feel the same. I feel the same about Nico Case, who I admire, but I'm never like, let's put some of that on, mm. you know. So 
I feel a little bit like, huh, I, I think I incline more towards she's doing something interesting than she's phony and worthless, but I'm just not interested in the interested thing she's well, doing. But, just, but I will take this, I will take this wreck and I will, I will spend some time with her. All right. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm nuts, but try uh, how to disappear. If you're on the fence about Lana Del Rey or Lana Curious, how to disappear is one of my favorite songs of hers. There, she's very prolific. She refuses to tour, but she does make music. Um, and so there are tons of them. Uh, if you like it, check it out. All right, let's move on. All right. Well, thanks, Julia. Thanks, you. Thanks, Dana. That was fun. It was a joy. You'll find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page. That's slate.com slash culturefest. And you can email us at culturefest at slate.com. We love it. Our introductory music is by the composer Nicholas Bertel. Our production assistant is Jessica Balderrama. Our producer is Cameron Drews. And a very, very special thank you to Best Buy for sponsoring us this week. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. For Dana Stevens and Julia Turner, I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you soon. Mm-hmm.